A few months back, this old Spider-Man show turned 20 years old. And coincidentally enough, I happened to be watching it again around the time of its anniversary. I actually mean it when I say that that was not intentional and was by complete coincidence. It's actually been a very long time since I've watched every episode of this show, and I also think I've only seen it twice up until now. So it was very interesting coming back to it. I think the first time I watched the show was right before Spectacular Spider-Man came out back in 2008, and then I watched it again in 2012, since all of the episodes were on Netflix at the time, and I was craving some more Spider-Man media after watching TASM 1 on its opening night. And that was the last time I watched the whole show. I did see a couple of episodes here and there throughout the years, since I think I saw the episode with the lizard getting a rerun on a TV channel at some point, and also for my birthday in 2014, one of my dad's co-workers gave me a DVD that had three episodes of the show on it, but either way, 2012 was the last time I've seen the whole show. So back in late 2022, Disney Plus added the spectacular Spider-Man and Spider-Man the New Animated Series. So when I heard about that, I figured I should watch the new animated series again at some point. Flash forward to August 2023, I watched it again due to A, the fact that I wanted to do so anyway, but also B, Insomniac's Spider-Man 2 was starting to get close to release, so I wanted to watch it again to further hype myself up for that game. Before we actually talk about the show though, let's talk about how this show came to be. MTV picked up the show and it was originally supposed to be a direct adaptation of the Ultimate Spider-Man comics. However, after Spidey's first big screen adventure hit theaters back in 2002 and was a massive success, both critically and financially, they decided that they wanted the show to be a continuation of the movie. So what we ended up getting was a bit of a combination of both. As a result of the show wanting to be a continuation of the film, they weren't allowed to use a lot of big time Spider-Man villains like Doc Ock, Venom, or Black Cat in case those villains were to be used in a Spider-Man movie in the future. So they instead opted to use lesser known Spider-Man villains like Kingpin or Silver Sable who probably would not be used for a movie as well as making some original villains like Shikata or Turbojet. Since the show was being aired on MTV, they were allowed to take the show in a more mature direction, but they also weren't allowed to have Aunt May in it because MTV feared that having an elderly person would deter their target audience. I admit that may sound weird, but when I was watching the show, I didn't really notice it that much and it didn't really bother me, so I can let that slide. With all of the introduction out of the way, let's actually talk about the show. Let's first address the fact that this show was meant to fit within the Rainiverse. Obviously, that didn't exactly fall through because of how the show ends on a cliffhanger, and then Spider-Man 2 completely ignored the events of this show. While that didn't exactly fall through, I still think it's cool that the events of the first movie are a reference point for the show. Harry, I get that you think Spider-Man killed your father, on account of he did. I guess you could look at this show as its own spin-off universe, like the movie tie-in games. This show does kind of give me that vibe from the movie tie-in games. But oddly enough, I've heard some people mention the fact that despite this show being based off of Raimi's Spider-Man, they get more Chasm vibes from it. And now that I've seen that mentioned, I remember feeling the same way when I watched the show back in 2012. Either way, this show did its own thing with the characters, and that's one of the reasons why I think it worked. The series takes place in college, which helps it stand apart and be more unique compared to other Spider-Man media. 
which is usually set in high school. One of the things that stood out to me as a surprise when I rewatched the show was how funny this version of Harry Osborn is. This version of Peter slash Spider-Man is also very solid. I think they managed to nail both sides of the character. He's very awkward and reserved as Peter, but he's very confident as Spider-Man. I also think Peter and MJ had great chemistry throughout the series. While they go through a will-they-won't-they they situation throughout the course of the show, I think it's all executed well and doesn't feel forced. Some of my favorite moments from the show involve the Peter and MJ romance plot, such as Peter trying to figure out a secret to share with her while he's patrolling as Spider-Man, or when he calls her about a date while waiting for a specific time to start his next Spidey mission. And we even got to see what was also in Spider-Man 2, where Peter can't make it to MJ's play because of his responsibilities as Spider-Man. Overall, they really portrayed the main trio very impressively in the series, and it's always a joy to get scenes of these characters interacting with each other. They even introduce a brand new character in the show named Indira Daimanji, who just goes by Indy, as a rivaling love interest for Peter, and I think she's a great addition to the roster, and I think it's a shame that this is the only time that we've ever seen this character. I think it would be a nice change of pace if they ever brought her into the comics or even the movies. I think the performances from the actors really sell it as well. They all play off of each other really well. In particular, I want to say that Neil Patrick Harris is a very underrated Spider-Man actor. If you were to tell me that the guy from How I Met Your Mother would be one of the best Spider-Man performances we've ever gotten, I wouldn't have believed you. But that is actually the case in my opinion. I think it is a crime that this guy has voiced Spider-Man so little. The only other time he returned to voicing Spider-Man again was in Shattered Dimensions. I was really hoping that he would return for the Avengers game, but unfortunately, that didn't end up happening. Of course, that game wasn't very good, but that's besides the point. While I was fine with the actor that they did pick for that game, I still would have preferred seeing Neil make a comeback. While I think all of the other actors in this show did a fantastic job, there is one outlier here, which is J. Jonah Jameson. He doesn't sound like J.K. Simmons, which is okay. This show was from 2003, so I can kind of give it a pass for that. But the fact that he doesn't sound like J.K. Simmons is not even the main issue. He just gives a very bland performance. Something I noticed is that this show doesn't really have much of an overarching plotline when it comes to the Spider-Man stuff. I feel like the overarching plot is tied to the Peter Parker moment and his dynamic with his friends. While Spectacular Spider-Man gave us the best of both worlds, I think Tanas having more of an emphasis on Peter's life is a pretty interesting direction to take a Spider-Man series. It's more of a slice of life style. I also think the way the show handled its villain roster was interesting. I think focusing on lesser known and original villains gave this show its own uniqueness. I'll also point out that I think the way Tasm 2 handled Electro was actually inspired by this show. I love the more mature tone that the show went for. Since this was the only Spider-Man show to have a PG-13 rating, they were able to do some pretty cool stuff with it. It definitely helps the show stand out among the other Spider-Man shows. In terms of its art style, I can see why some people would say that this isn't their cup of tea, but when I was re-watching this show, I was actually very impressed with how well the art style has aged. It's like the art style of Jet Set Radio and the Ultimate Spider-Man game that came out two years after the show mixed together. One of the things that impressed me the most with the animation is how they animate Spider-Man to move around like an actual spider. And during the web-swinging scenes, 
He does some poses that mimic the Spider-Man comics drawn by Todd McFarlane. These are things that I'm surprised that no other Spider-Man media has done. I mean, there was that one scene in Taz of One where Peter was crawling around Lizard's body like a real spider would. But other than that, we haven't seen anything like this, especially to this level, since 2003. I also have to say that the soundtrack for this show is something special as well. I love it when they use techno music for Spider-Man stuff, and it works very effectively here. Another thing worth mentioning is the fact that when the show was airing on MTV, they were actually airing the episodes out of order, so a lot of streaming services have the episodes out of order. However, the complete series DVD release actually has the episodes in the right order. Something unfortunate about the show is that it didn't last long at all. It only had one season containing 13 episodes and then got cancelled afterwards since MTV thought that the show didn't fit in with their other programming. Which is especially a shame considering the big cliffhanger that the show ends on. I would have really liked to have seen the series continue. But perhaps it being so short-lived was for the best, since that left the door open for another Spider-Man TV show to be made. So we eventually ended up getting the spectacular Spider-Man instead, which is hands down my favorite superhero TV show of all time. I also think Spectacular Spider-Man also helps Tenace age better as well, because I feel like if you were to watch Spectacular first, and then watch Tenace, you would appreciate it more. Because after you've seen a more faithful Spider-Man show, you're ready to see something more experimental. All in all, I'd say if it's been a long time since you've watched the show, or if you've never seen it before, it's definitely worth watching. Especially if you're looking for a Spider-Man adaptation that's more niche. This show set out to be different, and I think it achieved that goal very well. Even 20 years later, this show still manages to stand out from the other Spider-Man shows we've gotten. I had a very fun time going back to this show, and I'm happy to have gotten the chance to talk about it on the channel. See you next time. Okay, one last thing. Could I get a counter for every time MJ gets kidnapped in this show? Spider-Man! MJ! Uh, uh. Hmm. Uh, hey, let go of me, you pig!